We are coming to you from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology on the beautiful island of Okinawa, Japan, to celebrate the launch of ROS, the Rosalind Franklin Forum for Female Scientists, open to all. Viewers are invited to follow along with us at the website. ROS collects career questions from graduate students, postdocs, starting assistant professors, and their mentors around the world. Renowned senior scientists, also from around the world, from Asia, the Middle East, Oceania, Africa, Europe, and North and South America so far, answer selected questions with humor, compassion, and honesty. If you happen to work at a research base in Antarctica, please get in touch. With us today are Professor Paola Laurino, bioorganic chemist, originally from Varese, Italy. Erika Fukuhara, protein engineering graduate student whose roots are here in Okinawa. Tato Mohotu, neurosciences graduate student from Maseru, Lesotho. Sagnita Toledo Patino, postdoc in structural biology here from Morelia, Michoacan, Mexico. And Professor Peter Gruss, distinguished molecular cell biologist, president of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, German by birth and upbringing. In short, we are a microcosm of the United Nations Science Summit itself, and honored to be with you. I am Amy Stanton Gooch, a graduate student of OIST. I give you now Professor Lorino. Rosa is our lovely, loving nickname for Rosalind Franklin, an eminent chemist and crystallographer. In her name, we have created a career advisory website for graduate students, postdoc, entering assistant professor and their mentors. Rose also offers inspiring downloadable poster for supporter and anatomy of a research report, a checklist guide to written and verbal scientific communication. On the behalf of Rose, I'm so pleased to welcome and to thank you for joining us. We have selected five questions from the Ross website to consider today and asked each of you to identify the answer you consider most meaningful and impactful. Nikte, would you kindly read the question one followed by the answer you choose? And please let us know why you choose that answer. Sure, so the question I'm honored to read it goes on impact and it reads as follows. Um, in your experience, it is more effective for a new professor to address incremental questions on one topic within her comfort zone or a second one, uh, to undertake more uh, challenging and possibly more impactful big picture projects or a combination of both. So, it's a great question, and among many other of this, the answers, um, I selected one that I really liked, and it goes as, as follows. I was recruited as a lecturer, and I am now a full professor. Thus, I have walked the full path. As a department chair, I advise new researchers as follows. During the first years, until you get your tenure, pursue two lines of research. One, in which you have proven skill, and it's the reason you were recruited. And the second, that is ambitious. The comfort zone creates a solid basis for publication. And uh, one, you're successful and secure tenure. The sky's the limit. Leave your comfort zone. I think this is a great uh, answer because it's very complete from this professor. And it's a great piece of advice because um, I think we have to be all ambitious, of course, but sometimes taking a step out of our comfort zone doesn't really, uh, it's upon us. It's uh, depending on our career stage or it depends how much resources we have in the lab, etc. So it, it's very wise to also take it uh, a little bit more wisely, especially for projects that are, can take, I don't know, 10 years, for instance. And yeah, so we have to frame well these projects. On the other hand, however, I have to think Many times I encounter um, papers in my hand that I thought like, why I think came up with that? It's so simple and so beautiful. 
in so short. So yeah, a little bit of intuition, a little bit of uh, creativity is needed. So that's my opinion. Thank you, Anita. Does anybody else comment on the first question and the first series of answer about impact? Yeah, I would like to maybe chime in a little bit. I think that that was a really good answer because it focuses on the two aspects of familiarity with something as well as really going out of your comfort zone, but also honing in on the importance of prioritizing which one is more important, especially at the early career stage. So I think that really critically thinking about that and reflecting as a scientist on where you are in the journey and then deciding what's more important. Do I do something familiar and get tenure or do I go ambitious? Do I even have the resources, as she's mentioned, depending on which institution you are located? These are so practical that we have to consider everything to make the right decision. So I think that was a really comprehensive answer. Um, I would like to add something also on this uh, answer, which actually was also my <laughs> favorite one <laughs> for the I first can question. I add a little bit from my experience as a lab head. I called it a bread and butter policy. <laughs> <laughs> because you always have people that you advise, but you also need to do research uh, at the cutting edge, which is more risky, where the probability whether this will be successful is unclear. So the right thing to do is really to have a little bit of both, the bread and butter policy. Yeah, I think it's also very important. Huh? The, I mean, I'm for the high-risk project. <laughs> However, it's very important, uh, the um, small project, also for the atmosphere in the lab, because uh, people grow together, and it's important to publish small paper all together. Let's go for the second question. Tato, would you like uh, to read uh, to us the second question and also your uh, favorite answer or what you found more meaningful and impactful? Right, uh, happy to do so. So the second question is about independence and it reads as follows. First projects are often related to postdoctoral research. How soon must I try to differentiate independent projects from my previous work? And so I perused through the very many answers that we received and actually saw that a lot of them do kind of hone in on very similar aspects, but I did choose one which was my favorite. And this was from a person initialed SI who is in the field of deep learning and artificial intelligence. And their answer was, Familiarity feels safe, but only unique research questions allay misgivings that your lab is less your own than an outpost of your advisor's lab. Try not to worry about formulating distinctive questions. They are already taking shape themselves at the intersection of your intuition, the current literature, exposure to professors and speakers, and awareness of emerging technologies not forgetting the literature of a generation or two ago where pioneers identified then unanswerable, now answerable challenges. What you consider compelling is worthy of your best attention and effort. It will become synonymous with you. So for me, this was really interesting and I think it kind of adds on to the first question as well. This answer for me brought home the fact that building one's own scientific identity from the early point is really important and to establish what it is that you are contributing to the field, not just what your previous lab in your postdoc time was contributing to the field. But at the same time, it's also giving some practical advice about the fact that it can be difficult to do so. So they say, don't worry about you know, the creative part of how to come up with these distinctive questions, they are already taking shape. As long as you are exposing yourself to the literature and to the, post, um, the, the presentations and such. So I find this aspect kind of encouraging because it's not only saying be independent, be unique, but it's also telling you how to do so. And I think for me, um, just on a last note, the reason I identified a lot with this is that it kind of reminds me of my own lab. I'm not a postdoc, I'm a graduate student, but my current PI 
is very specific about us owning our own work. So when we go to conferences, he's always saying, if it's your project, you present it. I'm not going to represent it for you because I want people to associate your work with you and your face. And at first I found this a bit intimidating when I attended my first conference, but I understood afterwards that now people want to know me because they associate my work with me rather than with my boss. So I value this a lot. Yeah. Thanks so much. Good question. Does anybody else want I think she, this is the real right attitude. Um, no matter where you come from or what you need to establish, and that's why I like this advice to go out uh, to conference, you have to establish your profile as an independent researcher. That profile may build on your previous work. It should ideally not compete <laughs> with your previous boss, uh, yes. but it will, in the you know, context of your independent work, it will help you to be visible to the scientific community as the one who is doing this line. That's very important. Does anybody else want to add something? Or? I cannot add it to that. It was so yeah. a very yes. great answer. Yeah, I, I like the answer as well. That was my favorite for this question. Um, and I like that because as a first year student, I feel really pressured to be able to come up with my own projects and my own ideas. And the fact that like as long as you expose yourself to new ideas and continue to read literature, things will just come to you naturally. And then you have the support of your your professors and everyone around you to help you formulate new ideas and to be able to have the courage to explore new areas and everything like that. Thank you. Erika, would you like to read the question number three and uh, your, uh, the answer that you found most impactful? Okay. So the question that I have the privilege of answering to, uh, or reading today is um, this states, I consider collaboration a source of inspiration and collegiality as well as functionally important. At the beginning of my career, am I better off seeking collaborations, avoiding them in the name of independence, or placing myself somewhere on a continuum between the two? And while there were so many wonderful answers um, that I got to read, the one that really stuck out to me the most and the one that I really resonated with the most was a response from a professor researcher from India who goes by the initials RA and her response goes, on the one hand, do not collaborate automatically. A young PI learns by venturing into the unknown to some degree, acquiring new abilities instead of immediately turning to colleagues. On the other hand, highly specialized experiments outside your area call for collaboration, but consider the big picture. Do not depend on collaboration for most of the project. So I thought that this answer was the most appealing and most the one that resonated with me the most because she gave some really insightful advice for those starting their research career, whether it's your graduate student or if you're a professor. And I really thoroughly enjoy that she suggested that it's important that you develop your own foundation, that you make your mark, that you have to explore unknown areas and that you venture into unknown disciplines and tackle new ideas yourself before seeking the help of others. And then when you've established yourself and when you feel a bit more comfortable and you've done a lot more research, then collaborations are probably are going to be a lot more attractive whenever you want to get into more cross-disciplinary work. Um, because seeking the, the support of others and is undoubtedly going to be helpful whenever you come across a time in your project when you need um, skills and techniques that you don't have and you need the support of others to help you. And so I also really liked how she, she ended her response with saying that you shouldn't depend on collaboration entirely for your project because at the end of the day, this project is your own. You have to make sure you maintain your independence, you maintain the vision throughout your project, because um, you don't want that credit to be taken. Your ideas, you want to maintain that credit yourself. 
And as a PhD student, I feel like I can take this advice currently, now, and apply it to my graduate studies and, and continue to carry with me in my future. Thanks, Sadie. I hope you don't mind if I comment on this as well. Sure, <laughs> you can go ahead. <laughs> but this is very short because there are literally today, compared to 50 years ago, no single author papers anymore. So if you look at publications, most of the publications demonstrate what you just said. You need collaborations. For OIST, just to give you a number, 65% of the OIST's publications are written with an author that is outside of OIST. So it tells you, if you want to be competitive, you have to have the personality, go out, engage people, engage people with specific expertises to help you in your research. Yeah, I can comment a little bit. Uh, we cannot be the one-man orchestra or the one-woman orchestra. So I can just agree that um, we cannot be experts in everything, so we need some help. And I really enjoy these papers in which you see people, I don't know, using machine learning, yet another paper applied to another thing, and it's just great. So why not? Yeah. It's just really clear to me that it, it kind of goes both ways. Like on one hand, you establish yourself and your expertise and then bring on other people who have their own expertise, but also at the same time, because you've already established yourself in the field, you are going to be sought out to by other people who want to collaborate with you. So it is really making yourself more competitive in the field that way. So I think that's really important, yeah. I would like to add something about collaboration. Of course, collaboration is fun. <laughs> and we have to keep science <laughs> enjoyable. <laughs> um, Professor Gross, <laughs> as we call here at OIS, also uh, Peter, as Peter. Peter, exactly, <laughs> would like to read well, the question, our question uh, for. I would like to elaborate on. Thank you. Is do you agree that interdisciplinarity is the way of the future? Approximately what percentage of time did you invest in cross disciplinary work as an assistant professor versus today? Well, my assistant professorship is a long time ago. <laughs> but I, before I come to the answer that I think represents a certain aspect, I'd like to uh, point out that. I counted the answers. There were 24 answers, all of them positive. In other words, every one is supporting the use and the value of interdisciplinary research. I'll give you one from my own background. I was almost 20 years working in a Max Planck Institute for biophysical chemistry. <laughs> Everything under one umbrella. This institute has produced four Nobel Prize laureates working in the, the prize within the institute. And I, I will mention two of them. The one prize was uh, driven by neuroscience and was given to two people working in the neuro department at this institute. Uh, one was a medical doctor and the other was a physicist. And both worked together to develop a method called patch clam. Patch clam is a method where you have very fine capillary and you can measure everything through one receptor on the surface of the cell. So you can, this is important for drug development, this is important for science because all kinds of receptors you can test as to what opens the receptor, how is the flow of uh, information through the receptor. So that's the first thing. Second thing, uh, the second Nobel Prize more recently was uh, given to a person who is a physicist, but has again worked with a neuroscientist. And this person has developed a method uh, that is called STED microscopy. You have to understand that uh, in uh, light microscopy, so if you want to look at biological material, the light microscopy has a certain limitation of resolution, which is according, it's called Abbe barrier, has nothing to do with the previous prime minister. The Abbe barrier is 200 nanometers. 
So you cannot go below a resolution of 200 nanometer. But this guy has developed a method called state stimulation emission depletion, which means by means of uh, fluorescent molecules, he could go, go down to uh, 10, 20 nanometers, and by now it's at the, in the single nanometer range. So you, you get the message. <laughs> Without an environment, that is conducive to bring together experts from a variety of, uh, of areas, these Nobel Prizes would not have been worked out. Mm -hmm. I should also say, I think you had said this at the beginning, this was only possible because they had a stable funding. This, was not, this would not have been possible with the uh, NIH or uh, JSPS type grant. Mm -hmm. So after this long introduction, <laughs> after this long introduction, wait, let me read the answer. <laughs> and the answer that uh, I wanted, I, I picked was because it also gives you a little bit of the current thinking in the mainstream research. Interdisciplinarity has various facets. It lends more tools to bigger problems, but it can stretch an individual researcher a bit thin. Though ever present in the biosciences, it can lead to falling through disciplinary cracks in reviews. Try to ensure the right people see and champion your articles and proposals. I consider myself 100% interdisciplinary, but because I was also known in a defined area, I doubt that others saw me that way. Again, interdisciplinarity is subject to interpretation. So this, I thought, is a very smart answer because it, it outlines the use, the value, but it also outlines the danger. Many scientific fields are streamlined through the refereeing process. So let's say if you, I don't know if, uh, what your discipline is, so sorry, <laughs> but uh, let's say you are, you are a neuroscientist, mm -hmm. you're talking about it, okay? Uh, and then all of a sudden you're working with a physicist to do something completely different. You will have a problem convincing the referees that have seen you as a neuroscientist all your life that this may be valuable. For a young person, this is even worse because your career is also tracked with, uh, with, with what we just discussed. You have to get a profile in the young stage of your career in a certain area. This profile is you know, added if you add some interdisciplinarity, but if you completely move out, you will get a complete new profile. And you have to consider yourself whether you have enough time to establish this profile. Having said all of this, you need to do what you think will address a scientific question most profitably. That's the only thing that matters. Trust your gut feeling. But as I said, watch out for the pitfalls. Yeah, the gut feeling is a good, it's a good point. We have to develop a little bit of intuition for approaching people and exactly not to deviating too much from our projects because of, of course we are not experts so it might be dangerous I think so too. And perhaps this intuition comes with time and experience within the field to know what to look out for and what to watch out for because I think it can be a little bit difficult to even explain to somebody who's just entering the field. Yeah, you might learn all the technical words and all, right? right. It might and it takes time. It takes time. It time. takes a yeah. lot of time. Yeah. So you must be willing to give this time right. and be patient and not right. rush. What I do appreciate uh, when it comes to OIST and the setup of OIST, if I can talk a little bit about that, is just the way that our labs are structured. It is very easy if you're a person who is pro-interdisciplinarity to actually form those meaningful connections with people who are outside of your lab because we are not divided by departments. So we have a neuroscience lab and there's a molecular biology lab right there and there's you know a chemistry lab right next door. So 
at lunchtime you're talking to these people. We have internal seminars where you have presentations from people of different fields and they are presenting in such a way that the information is accessible to you. So if you do find some common interests, it does make the pathway to making this conversation happen a slightly more easier platform so that the initiation can happen. So I think that this is something that other universities might not have that we do have here at OIST. Yeah, there is, uh, I think, other two plus point of OIST, of course, the support, mm -hmm. and also the fact that um, we are not so big. I think a right. small community uh, can interact easier and uh, better rather we have, when it becomes too big probably it's more diluted yes to have interaction <laughs> with someone really out of your field right. i'm going to read the, the last question question number five and uh, i've chosen also one um, answer which was the most one of the most meaningful actually all of them are very meaningful Question five is about uh, advisors and networking. The question reads like this. How did you build a network of male or female colleagues and mentors who helped and advised you onto the path you took? How and where do you interact with these friends today? I found uh, particularly interesting the answer of SI. She specializes in deep learning and artificial intelligence. Some curiosity is unusually penetrating, well-trained, and always on highest alert. Some people question their own thinking. They probe what they encounter or create. They make unexpected connection. They can summon enormous concentration. They express themselves elegantly with economy and evident enjoyment in person and in print. We value these colleagues, whether senior, contemporaries, or younger, and form lifelong association with them. As for mutual aid groups, I have yet to experience an effective one, but certainly consider myself part of a movement promoting inclusivity in science. Why I found this uh, very interesting, actually this and few of others. I think uh, because she point out that we should not limit our advisors or supporters to colleagues in our own field. Whoever is curious, she says, well-trained well train or question their own thinking, that can be someone we want to connect and keep connection. Um, there is something that uh, many of uh, the senior scientists actually point out uh, is the importance to have collaborator in younger scientists. I think often people underestimate this, but this is very important uh, and I think also enjoyable. And uh, there is something else that I identify myself. I also found difficult to have a mutual eight groups. Rather, I think about advisor as single person. Um, this can be a friend from elementary school or <laughs> a senior scientist in another field or someone very close to my field or maybe my direct advisor. And another thing I identify myself is the fact that uh, um, yes, probably initiate, uh, I mean, I'm for surely initiate uh, uh, Ross because I wanted to um, promote inclusivity in science. Uh, does anybody else want to comment or other qu uh, answer on advisor or networking? Do you find difficult uh, networking? Uh, I, now I don't find it too difficult, but I have to admit that when I was an undergraduate student especially, it was overwhelming to approach a senior scientist. So I, something that, that I particularly found very useful was that my previous supervisor um, would help me. For example, we go to a conference and she would say, oh, look, this is Nikte, and she works on this and that. You might want to talk to her about this and this. So it was, you know, like the big step is done and now you just have to fill the gas. So that, that was very useful. And I think the more you do it, the more naturally it becomes. And 
you have to forget about being shy, I think, <laughs> if you want to, to build uh, a network. I agree with having connections with people outside of your scientific circle because it's important to make friends and to make colleagues who understand what you're researching, but I think I've made a lot of connections with those who are completely different from the field. I still have friends who are like in psychology or not even in research at all, but they provide me a lot of emotional support to help me get through my graduate studies. Like going from undergraduate degree to straight into my PhD has been extremely difficult, but to have friends who can support me and overcome all these hurdles, like it's extremely helpful. Anybody else wants to comment? If not, <laughs> we can go on. <laughs> ROS exists to promote scientific inclusivity and diversity through equal, full access to important information. It should never be necessary to guess or intuit it, the custom and criteria of academia. There will always be a safe place to ask questions. You are never alone. Ross is there for you. In that light and in closing, I call your attention to a second feature of Ross. We call it Anatomy of a Research Report. It is sentence by sentence, word by word, guide to the scientific presentation and writing you will have to constantly do. Nikte, did you have a chance to have a look at? Yes. Um, anatomy of a Research Report. Would you I like to call it? Yes, I found the, the idea very useful. I think, um, I don't know, I think structure in everything brings something useful. If, even if when you read an email and somebody uh, writes an email structure, it, you enjoy reading it because it you know, respects your time and everything. So it's the same when you have a research report. Not only uh, you can formulate it better for like, your supervisors or probably future colleagues that are going to be working on this project, but uh, also for the reader in general, like uh, for example, a paper when it's well written, then uh, it's much more easier to, to get an idea, for instance. So I think it's very useful and very important to, to introduce some structure to, to the research report. Do you have any advice about scientific writing? Or communication, scientific well, communication? You better learn it. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, the writing is how you establish yourself for eternity. Mm. Uh, actually, in the German language, we have a saying, those who write stay. Mm. Yeah. Translated. Um, so, in other words, uh, you know, our world is fast. And if I go back to the 19th century, for example, people who are very well known and the fundamental work, they published a book or two in their life. This is over. So you need to learn structured writing. And from our point of view, <coughs> I think OIST is going to support this. Uh, we will have courses uh, for, for, for writing, I mean scientific writing. Uh, hoping that at the end of the day you cannot and will not leave this university without having written your own papers. <laughs> <laughs> at least the first draft. <laughs> then go to the other I think this is a very considerate um, approach and I'm really happy that we have it and people can access it because as she said, it can be a really overwhelming transition if you're going from undergrad to, to postgrad and knowing what is expected by the field and the standard and the level of writing, this gives us this kind of guideline and I think that it will make life much, much easier and will save a lot of time <laughs> for people to know exactly what's the point of this paper, what am I trying to communicate, what are the aspects that are important and just cut out all the fluff and just say what needs to be said. Yeah, I think it's really important. I hope lots and lots of people gain access to it. I was actually quite excited to see this yeah. um, because I just started my second year 
And so now I'm going to have to start thinking about my thesis proposal. And so being able to communicate all my ideas, what's important, what's not important, how do I structure everything, how do I organize everything, I think this is going to be extremely helpful. It really will take, off, take the load off of things, um, help me better communicate my ideas whenever I write. Lastly, in addition to question and answer and to our invaluable guide, Anatomy of a Research Report, Rose also provides a photographic sampling of our strong, determining, inspiring international supporter. Anyone might download their poster in various size and display them on their bench, door, always, or even take them to conference. We are proud of this poster. To finish, <laughs> I ask you if you can think of any person apart from your doting mother, a colleague <laughs> who gave freely of his or her information, knowledge, skill, support to you, an advisor, an helper. Tato, do you have someone in mind? You can just say the first name. <laughs> apart from my... Doting mother. <laughs> your mother doesn't count. You shouldn't <laughs> say your mom. <laughs> <laughs> With someone who provided me freely. Yeah. Yes, advice. yes, so knowledge, skill, support. So many, it's hard to choose one. <laughs> I can say a few names for myself. Mm -hmm. I can say recently Nobu, for a long time Danny. Uh, Erika? For me, um, the first person that always comes to mind is Amy. She's been in my life, she's helped me like immensely since I've been here. And she's been super helpful, super guideful. Like she's given me so much guidance and I really appreciate all the support that she's given me since I've been here. Currently support or support? <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> because, okay, this is not my mother, but it's close to the, the mother of my father, my, my grandmother. She gave me so many advices and uh, not, not research related, but academic related. She always, um, she, had not the, she didn't have the opportunity to study, so she told me, uh, you better do that, to be independent from any man and be independent. I mean, she's almost 90, so you can imagine that this is the, the thinking of the past. So yeah, that was a good advice, I think. Yeah, I think for me, I can think of two people. So the first postdoc I worked with at OIS, this was an Abudnot unit, and she's no longer at OIS because um, the lab closed down, but her name's Teresa, and she's from Mexico. And she was the first person to actually teach me a lot of the techniques that I now know in neuroscience, because at the time, my PI didn't really have the time to be in the lab. He was more doing administrative duties. And I really relied on Teresa for all of the <laughs> experimental work. Um, but also I remember a high school teacher of mine who once told me that if ever you're given an opportunity, if, if you're given an opportunity to be the first at something, to volunteer for something or to initiate something, don't ever be shy to raise your hand. Always be that person who says me <laughs> and then figure out the steps later, but always say me. And honestly, this has been one of the motors I've used throughout my life and has gotten me to where I am now because I've not been afraid to just take the plunge when no one else had laid the foundation in front for me. I never had to say, oh, but I don't know anyone at this university. How am I going to go? I was the first person at OIS from my country because of this kind of mindset that I'm not afraid to be the first. And this is because of what that high school teacher once said. <laughs> Thank you. You want to tell us? Well, I can, you know, of course, it's uh, a bit outdated if I talk about my mother, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, mother. Mother doesn't count. <laughs> I can talk about other things that uh, I find important uh, throughout the course of your careers. and. Um, uh, the two elements that uh, we should never forget is be courageous and be critical. And the reason I'm saying this is, uh, you are now, many of you, I mean, so I'm sorry, I don't know what state you're at, but um, many of you are learning the trait. The trait is experimental, the trait is theoretical, uh, it gets you ready to be yourself. And that's why I'm saying be courageous and be critical. 
So it could be a great poster, but if you have, advising you, sorry, <laughs> but if you have the feeling, you have an idea that is different, don't be dissuaded. That means in science, very often, it's the pathway you pick that is different from the route others take. So be courageous, be critical. Uh, you can accept, you know, training, but at some point you've got to find your own way. Thank you, Peter. So I ask you for um, an advisor because Rose wants to be that person for you. At Ross, you are welcome anytime, any day, wherever in the world you are, around the clock. You are always welcome to visit the Ross website and uh, the answer. Again, I thank each of you for your generosity in participating today. We are fully grateful for countless forms of encouragement and assistance given by OIST. And we are honored to have taken part in this United Nations Science Summit. Goodbye for now. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>